Say a prayer now, facing the cross. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Come, Holy Ghost, and fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who this instruct the hearts of thy faithful by light of the Holy Ghost, grant that by gift of the same spirit, that we may be always truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolations, through the same Christ our Lord. Saint Joseph, all thy garden angels and saints. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Please be seated, and welcome back to uh, the adult catechism. It's been a while since we've had a class, and so I hope that I can keep these up as much as I have a priest to hear confessions while I'm down here giving the catechism. Unfortunately, with the loss of Father Hawker, I lost my big helper, who would hear confessions while I gave catechism. So as much as we can, we will, but it all depends on priestly help. I want to talk to you about the three points today on the board, liberalism, religion, and the Our Father, according to the Council of Trent Catechism. We were doing the Our Father quite often for a series, and we didn't finish that up. So I want to be able to cover the last or tail end of that catechism um, on the Our Father because that was the last part of our catechism series after doing the creed, what we believe, and then the code, which is the commandments. And now we have the prayer that we covered, the Our Father, very important. Religion is very important to understand. We'll take some hints from Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, a reminder of how that's allied to virtue of justice. And so it's very important to get that down very well. It's not as though we may have to memorize all of this right now, but the act of religion is an ongoing act through our whole life. So hopefully by the time we get to the end of our life, we will have it perfect. Certainly will when we go to heaven, because we'll be honoring God and adoring him forever. But nonetheless, the religion is a fulfillment of justice. And so we want to talk to talk about that. And then, of course, I mentioned the Our Father. So liberalism, religion, the Our Father is our lineup this morning for catechism. The book that I'm referencing, which I would like you to have a copy or read at some point, is Liberalism and Catholicism, put out by Angelus Press. This book by Father A. Roussel was published in just a moment. 1998, and so it's very important to understand how liberalism has infected all of us, and especially liberalism and Catholicism, how it works, and what's been happening ever since Vatican Council II, even before, but after especially. How it was as though the Vatican Council II canonized liberalism and its infestation or effect or Um, influence upon modern Catholics. So liberalism, Catholicism. And that's a big work, as you can see. It's not a big book, but it's a very in-depth study. And I'll just lay out a few things to pique your interest and hopefully understand how liberalism is really the root of so many evils. It's really the root of modernism, which allowed modernism to take root. Really at the root of modernism is liberalism. And then Modernism just, it was like a vehicle to spread liberalism throughout the church. We'll go over a couple little graphs from Leo XIII, his understanding, when he wrote on the principles of liberalism. He said they're the most perverse of all. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. First, just a couple notions on liberty, because sometimes we hear this word liberalism, and we just think we're being full of liberty. We're just focused on liberty. And liberty is a very important thing for mankind. We fought for it. We've died for it. We know that the church protects it. She does. She protects our liberty. A man must be free to honor God. A man must be free to work out his destiny in this life, his salvation, in order to go to God. He shouldn't be inhibited. He should not be somehow prohibited. He should not be, uh, you know, bound that he can't do his duty to God, which is... Obviously, what happens in a lot of state governments nowadays. I just heard about Zelensky 
over in Ukraine, he has forbidden people to, to even go into some churches. He's, uh, he's arrested monks, mon monks and nuns. I just heard about this yesterday. And he's even forbidden there to be another election. So that's how democratic they are over there. And we're helping them. Oh, boy. So anyway, these type of things, don't be very careful. These governments are not about true liberty, and they're not about honoring God. Because a man must have his liberty to honor God. And so we're going to go over just a couple things. What does this mean, liberty? Liberalism, as its name implies, presents itself as a system of liberty. And that's the false flag. That is the, um, the trick. But what is liberty? This, again, poses a problem because this word has a variety of meanings. In general, the word liberty suggests an idea of non-necessity or the freedom from constraint. <clears throat> you know, a little child could say that to its parents when it's put in the safety seat in the car, you know. You're hurting my liberty. Would you agree? I hope you don't. But if you agreed, then you'd be a liberal too. But he wants to be a liberal. You can't constrain me. Well, yes, we can. Because you don't know the liberty I'm granting you by saving your life or by not, my not going to jail or getting a ticket when I'm pulled over by the cops. There's a lot of things that are, the child doesn't even comprehend. It, it can't comprehend. It just has to be told what to do. And that constraint is not against his liberty, but a protection of it long term. So anyway, that's an example. We want to think, though, that liberty, liberalism is no constraints. It signifies a certain independence and a self-mastery, of course. Without going into endless distinctions, let us note three principles, three meanings of liberty. Number one, the external or physical liberty. So if you're keeping notes, you can write, what is true liberty? And we're going to describe what are true, true notions of liberty. Number one, a physical liberty. And that's the liberty of action. We can actually walk from here to there. Nobody's going to stop me. I can do my farming. I can do my work. I can raise my family. I have a liberty of action, which signifies exemption <clears throat> of any exterior physical necessity or constraint, an absence of obstacles to natural activity. And that's exactly what we do to prisoners, criminals. Why do we put them in handcuffs? Why do we put them in a prison? Because they've lost their liberty. They've... they've uh, given up their liberty by committing the crime. And you hope that the enforcement, the law enforcement, is thinking, this man is owed liberty, but he has thrown it away. I put him in handcuffs to hopefully find out what happened, hopefully to give him the punishment necessary so he can go back to his liberty. Although, as you know, sometimes there's no, no going back to liberty according to certain crimes. But... Nonetheless, the idea is, give the punishment, the man's corrected, he can go back to his liberty. That's why there's constraint. So anyway, physical liberty, you know what that is. What about internal, internal physical liberty, what we call free will? This is libitas a necessitate. This is like the big liberty, is a free will. Actually, you can constrain a man temporarily, but you're not taking away his free will. The liberty of choice that exempts from any internal necessity. Such as, this is so important that if a man and woman <clears throat> got married and they didn't have this free will in getting married, there would be no marriage. That's, that's how powerful this free will is. It, this, this free will is so powerful, it's the difference between being virtuous and sinful. It's the difference between committing a mortal sin and no mortal sin. You can take two individuals who do the same action, one freely and the other not freely, and there's a difference of responsibility or gravity. And that's why we say that the person who's mentally handicapped, someone who is deranged, his level of responsibility for criminal action is different from the man who's sane. That's why everybody wants to become insane, to get out of their criminal activity. It's silly, but... They'd rather be insane and not pay for their price, the price of their actions. It's also this, this, I found it to be a similar thing too, when people come up to me, Father, Father, I'm so bothered in my soul. I think the devils are possessing me. I mentioned it at the first mass. Father, 
they're, they're really, I, I must be possessed. You'd rather be possessed than do what you're supposed to do. You'd rather be bothered by the devil than just going into that confessional box over there. Or living your life as a true Catholic. Incredible. Anyway, free will is so precious to us. It's rooted in spirituality. It makes man responsible for his actions. This liberty is proper to an intellectual being opposed to determinism. So do we talk about free will or liberty with monkeys? No. People get all upset, you know, the PETA people get all upset at animals being locked up. And, and I understand there can be an inhumane, humane, that's like making them human. Anyway, there can be this type of abuse of an animal. True, that's wrong, and God will punish you for it. But they don't have free will. They're not free in the sense that we're free. They can't make choices like that. Not even a monkey, even though the evolutionists say we're so close to monkeys. They may be somebody's relative, but they're not mine. <laughs> Moral liberty is another very important liberty. So this is the interior physical liberty, which is reasonable and limited by its object. What does that mean? Let's take a very concrete very concrete um, moral liberty. You know that there's certain things that because of your office, you are allowed to do this. So something like myself. I am the pastor of this church. I have a certain moral liberty to accomplish the things around me, but that doesn't extend into somebody else's house or into the government or who knows what. I can't do whatever I want with their money or with their people. I am limited by my office. I am limited by what it is I'm in charge of. There's a reasonable, limited object which proceeds from a legitimate authority. If you have the legitimate authority, you can do this, just like a father in his home. The other father down the street doesn't have any authority in his home. Law traces the limits of free will, which it cannot exceed, but it can and must follow. So there again, when you're a, a writer of law, you're a judge, a lawyer, a legislator, you have to be thinking, hmm, free will. All these liberties I've mentioned, physical liberty, free will liberty, moral liberty. Okay, if I make this law, what happens to those individuals? Is it helping them to gain more liberty or is it hurting them? I have to be thinking about that. In this sense, liberty is synonymous with right and is expressed in the plural as liberties, franchisements, rights. We're all about rights now, human rights, animal rights, children's rights. And it always seems to be to take away somebody else's right. It's very funny. All the rights that everybody wants to assume, it's always at the detriment of somebody else's right or of free will or of what we owe to God. Incredible. We just don't have a right. Something's wrong. Other liberties are simply emanations of these three types. So civil liberty is a faculty to accomplish. Political liberty is a reasonable and proportional participation of citizens in affairs of a common interest. And as you know, in some countries that's wider than others. Some, are very, some liberties politically are very much more narrow in some countries where there's a political or a common interest and it's very narrow. But here in the United States, it's pretty wide. I would say though, that in certain fields it's become very narrow. Unless you follow the narrative, you have no rights. Unless you follow the liberty of the narrative, you, you have no rights. That's what it's become in this country, just like in many communist countries. So, what other liberty? Well, Catholics affirm and maintain two principles, the reality of the free will and a necessary dependence on God. So, imagine that, we're trying to balance We're talking about liberalism, which we do not want. Liberty, true liberty, is balancing the balance of free will and so I would say it's not necessarily number one, but a concomitant with um, Dependence on God. Okay, 
So we have to balance that. Now, is it possible my free will needs to give way to God? Yes. Sometimes you find that happening. <laughs> How many men and women getting married, entering into their vocation, they want to do this. Their free will says, I want to make this choice. Oh, no. But God says, the commandment says, I have to do this. So it can be the case that we'll find that this comes against each other. But we have to know the hierarchy. Why, where do I get my free will from? From God. And I will be truly free by be, being dependent on God, not against him. That would be license. So the true notions of liberty is that a Catholic affirms that he has a free will, which equals not, equals not determined. We're not determinists. Oh, I'm missing a word. But anyway, you understand. This is, uh, this is uh, shorthand. So free will equals not determinist. Okay? Dependence on God equals not, though, some kind of license. I don't just have license to do whatever I want against God. I hope there's supposed to be an S in here, too. Oh, there it is. Um, I'm not doing well with my spelling today. So I'm not very free today, you see, in my spelling. I seem to be determined by something. So his law, God's law, and all authority that proceeds from him, we're necessarily dependent upon it. We're not going to get outside of it. There's a certain order, structure, we call it creation, that God made that we have to work within. And that's the problem with a lot of science today, medicine, politics. They all think, oh, I have a free will. I can just do whatever I want. And they don't even check back with God. I think I told you once before. A lawyer was doing his um, master's. I, no, actually, it was a doctorate, probably. Anyway, he was doing his thesis in front of the panel, and he said, I'm going to make my thesis on the natural law. They looked at each other, the panel of judges. We still hold natural law, they said to one another. Oh, yeah. That's so crazy to me. That a person would say to another person next to him, they're, they're going to be judging. They're going to be determining this lawyer's thesis based on natural law. And they don't even know what natural law is. That's a big problem in today's society. Well, of course you can have abortion then. Of course you can have transgender and all these surgeries. Of course you can tell children they're not boys or girls. Because there's no natural law. Wow. Wow. So the faculty that enables him, a man, to operate in good, the faculty by which he may attain his end without hindrance, is very important, his free will. Okay, so again, liberalism does not mean true liberty. Liberalism, and I'll tell you from Pius, or no, sorry, Leo XIII, what he said in a little graph. I'll just make some comparisons if I can find the right page here. This is in our book. Um, liberalism, Catholicism. You can look at it yourself sometime. An example. Okay, this is a table, and on one side is the liberal, on one side the Catholic. I just want to show you the comparison. The following table will make it easy for us to compare liberal principles with their conclusions, with Catholic principles and their conclusions. Now, we may find ourselves a liberal. I was in the seminary being taught by the priests. And I found I was a liberal. Not real bad, but still. 18-year-old liberal. And I grew up with a very conservative family. And I didn't think anything about acting against God in the church. No, quite the contrary. But this kind of thing that we breathe in and that we swallow all the time, this liberalism. So here they are. Column one in our panel, the liberal Reason is the source and measure of everything. Whereas the Catholic says, reason is subjected to its object, both natural and supernatural. So it's not just a free-for-all. No. My reason is already subjected to the objects around me, both natural and supernatural. I have to conform to them. It's not the same for the liberal. Number two for the liberal 
Every individual is just that, autonomous in his reasoning. No. Catholic says, reason comes from years of tradition. Now, maybe you start to hear, by my introducing this word of tradition, you already start to hear why Vatican II, why modernism, why modern clergy can do what they do, because there's no truth that's objective. Liberalism has told them, liberalism has trained them to say the individual is autonomous in his reason. Everything comes from me. You can't stop me because I'm a free individual. Okay? Number three, there's a certain autonomy of will. And the Catholic says, no, dependence upon the law in regards to good. So the commandments, the precepts of the church, natural law, all of these laws keep me in order. I'm not free from them. I don't have an autonomy to do whatever I, will, I would like. Number four for the liberal, atheism or pantheism is fine for him. Now, you would say a Catholic may not do that because he says, oh, I believe in God. But you know what? There are Catholic liberals, and there are so many varying degrees of them. As I told you, I was partly liberal in the seminary. And I know it by just listening to the popes, listening to my professors tell me about the popes, tell me about the doctrine, tell me about the Catholic Church. Number five, the liberal says, man is self-sufficient. The Catholic says, God alone is a necessary being. Because I don't know if you made the parallel there. When someone says they're self-sufficient, they don't need anybody else. There's only one being like that. And I've told you before when I've laid out the hierarchy in catechism. We're all dependent on this long string. Call it a rope. Call it an anchor. A chain. A cable. We're all dependent on God. He is the necessary being. I am not the necessary being. I could come and go. But not God. And unfortunately, they teach men and women that they're self-sufficient in themselves. That's where we get all this feminism and all this ri ridiculousness and even masochism and all these machoisms, all these isms come from this fact that, oh, I'm self-sufficient. I can do whatever I like to whoever I like. No, it's not true. Number six, that liberty is an end in itself. That's what liberalism ultimately is. That my liberty is an end in itself. It's not true. Liberty depends upon authority, law, and order. So the Catholic says, no, liberty depends upon God's authority, on all the authorities that God has established. The liberal also says, man is essentially good. No, says the Catholic. Man is corrupted by original sin and his personal sins. That's the bon sauvage of um, Descartes. You know, all these philosophers, they thought that man, if left to himself, would be just a perfect human being, perfect individual, that we've corrupted him by society. That the, the structure of society, the structure of the church, the structure of governments has corrupted men. That's not true. We need that. But, of course, in proper measure, right? What do we see today? When you don't control yourself, you're not that bon sauvage that you should be. You've been given too much liberty, which is liberalism. Then what happens? The authority comes around and makes more rules. There are so many ridiculous laws and rules today in society just because you and I can't think right. We can't make good choices. We don't care about anybody else. And see, that's a Catholic principle. Charity, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That's a basic natural principle that the Catholic Church protects. And yet, if you're not doing that, of course you have to have laws because you're going to hurt somebody. So if we can't control ourselves, we can't govern ourselves, and somebody will. Somebody will, even if it's a tyranny or a dictator. But that's what liberalism leads us to. Now, what's another thing uh, that they say? Maybe something like equality. Well, where the Catholic says, wait a minute. There's hierarchy in organization. Not just an equality. And not everybody's on the same level. That's what the modernist wants you to understand. 
There's no need for the priesthood. There's no need for, strictly speaking, for religious orders and monks. You could do that if you want, but really, really, the, the power, the equality rests in every one of the faithful and all of these people we call priests who are presiders over assemblies. They're all equal. There's no need for anybody to be hierarchy or to be higher or to be the boss because we're democratic. That was the movement, and Archbishop Lefebvre spoke highly against this, quite a bit, I would say, against this, is this type of democracy that was introduced into the church through fraternity, collegiality, inequality, or religious indifference. Okay, so that gives you a, a sense of it. It is a supreme peril for both society and for the individual. It warps the mind, corrupts the judgment, adulterates consciences, enervates characters, inflames the passions, ties down governments, stirs up the governed. <laughs> That's what we're living through. There's a book for you to read, Liberalism and Catholicism, put out by Angelus Press. Religion. Okay, so here we are. We have a liberty. We want to fulfill justice with God in our neighbor. But part of that with justice towards God is our religion. The virtue of religion is allied to the virtue of justice because we cannot give to God perfectly what is his due. The way we have to get close to it is through religion. And as you know, that's the holy sacrifice of the mass and everything that flows from it. You will never give back to God what is sufficiently his except through his son. It's except through our Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the only way. But we don't just do it once. He did it once, but we can't survive on once. We have to keep doing it. Otherwise, we start straying. We have to keep up this act of religion. There are those few saints, right, who went to Mass once, died, and they're saints. They went to communion once, never committed another sin. They went to communion once and never, never um, lived much longer, and they passed away in a state of grace. Well, that's unique. That may be an example for us. We know that we have to keep up this action of religion to try to keep paying God back because everything, as much as we pay him back one day, he gives us a hundred more things and we're still behind. We'll never be able to pay him back perfectly except through the virtue of religion, except through the mass. Religion is a virtue by which you render to God the worship due to him. Religion is one of the virtues related to justice and so there's a strict duty to render to God what is due to him. Hopefully, by that very statement, you understand why Holy Mother Church says, keep holy the Sabbath. Go to Mass. It's one of the precepts of the church. Because if we're not, we're taking a step back from God, we're moving away, and we'll have a hard time catching up. It's so important to try to set these scales of justice with God, and we're always going to be behind. So we keep pushing it up with the virtue of religion. Religion is a virtue annexed to the virtue of justice. Why? Because it does not contain all three notes of justice. What are the three notes of justice? It's not something we always think about. But in justice, there's an equality. Look at marriage again. Husband says, I give you this wife. She says, I give you this. When they stood before the altar, they both gave each other their flesh equally. And then there's other places like that where we talk about equality, and that is in a contract. Sir, I want you to replace my roof. Okay, sign this contract here. You do the work, I'll pay you. It's equality. I give you something, you give me something. And it balances. There's no equality between us and God, though. So that's one note of justice that's gone. So that's why we say it's annexed to, but it's not justice. Because justice is an equal giving back and forth. Mutual giving back and forth. Okay, of a th something you agreed to, right? To give it to another man what is his due. But that doesn't exist between us and God. So that one's out of the picture. Um, finally, there's this debitum, the thing owed by us. So we owe God something, but he doesn't owe us anything. That's very uh, humbling. 
<laughs> he doesn't owe us anything. We owe him everything. And that's something in justice also. If you take, the man says, oh, I'm going to give you a gallon of milk from the cow, then you should pay him back for it. You owe him something. So there's no equality between us and God. There's no equality of debt. We owe, but he doesn't. And then the other one would be um, the other note of justice um, is this fully rendering, you know, so that's to say, okay, so maybe somebody says to you, I will do this work for you and then you can pay me back in installments, like when you buy your car maybe, or you do some work. Well, it's not as though you're not in justice trying to help out, but you're way behind. He did the work or he gave you the object and you're trying to catch up. There's a rendering. I have to render to him until it's fulfilled. And even that, of course, we never fully render to God everything we owe him. But we have to try to do so. So just think about this virtue of religion, annex to vir the virtue of justice. So important. That's why we should, it puts us on our knees. It puts us every Sunday in a place where we need to be to pay God back. Adore him. The acts of religion are many. Um, the acts of the virtue of religion are presented Consider the place of prayer, the mass, and the Christian life. These themes will be developed in this book. I'm reading from the book of the Archbishop, The Spiritual Life, a, a grand book of all a collection of his sermons and conferences on these very points. The spiritual life does not consist in feelings and emotions, in feeling an immense desire for union with God. It's not about having practically the gift of tears or of so longing to be united to God that it's all we can think of day in and day out. That's all fine and very nice. That's a nice consolation. That's not where devotion lies. So what is the criterion of our devotion to God himself? What does God look at in us to know if we are pleasing to him? And we just have to look at the Gospels. When our Lord himself said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That is the show. That's how we prove our love to God, by keeping the commandments. And then he'll let us grow in that, because we know what the highest of all the commandments is. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and thy whole soul. That's really the summation of all the commandments. So if you keep the commandments, you're showing you love me. And by doing so, you climb the ranks to the point where you're loving me, and you're loving your neighbor as yourself. And he also said, when people tell him that his mother and his brethren wanted to see him, he says, who is my mother and who are my brethren? Whoever does the will of my father. We heard that in the gospel today. You must be not only hearers of the word, but doers. Of course, prayer is very important to us, and that's part of this virtue of religion. Not only sacrifice and adoration, but prayer. The prayer in the sense of my communication with God. By praying, St. Thomas says, man renders his mind to God. He's like, <laughs> when you're praying your rosary, you're praying at mass, you're praying your mental prayer, whatever it is you're doing, you're taking your mind and presenting it to God. You're rendering, surrendering your mind to God. Since he subjects it to him with reverence, so to speak, presents it to him. What a beautiful expression. Well, another act of religion I just barely mentioned is adoration. So there's not only this, this sacrifice to God through the Mass, there's this adoration, which you know comes up in the Our Father also. The Mass and the Our Father fill, fulfill perfectly adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication. The acts, as you know. I've told you that before, but it doesn't hurt to put it up again. The acts of prayer. Adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, supplication. This is often also made uh, as P, which doesn't work with the acronym. P is petition. You could say petition instead of supplication. But every prayer should fulfill those ends, especially our Father, especially the Mass. But we can make that intention. I often do when I'm praying my prayers. Think about, okay, Lord, I'm adoring you. I'm sorry for the sins I've committed against you. I thank you for everything you've given to me, and I ask you for help in my apostolate. 
just like that. It's very easy. Fathers, teach your children, teach your families how to do that. And that makes a man a truly prayerful man. Okay, we need to move on to the catechism. Barely. I will be giving my signal soon. I just want to say and draw your attention again to the end of the Our Father. We were discussing a few classes. You can go back and look on the YouTube uh, catechism classes and be able to get the whole first part of the Our Father spread out over a little bit of time. But I want to point out to you just a couple of things. The uh, first thing being that as we talk about liber liberty, as we talk about religion, the Our Father is telling us the prayer we've said for years, thy will be done. We give everything back to God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we invite him. We know his will is done in heaven. We invite him by that very prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that involves us. And here the Council of Trent says, Though the faithful are not to be left in ignorance of the importance of this petition, yet in this connection, many questions concerning the will of God may be passed over, which are discussed at greater length in other scholastic doctors. Because many people talk about the will of God. There's a permissive will of God. There's the absolute will of God. We don't have to worry about that. When we say that our Father and when we say that will be done, we're talking about this right here. We content ourselves with saying that by the will of God is here meant that will which is commonly called, and this is very interesting, the will of sign. Sign, S-I-G-N, the will of sign. That is to say, whatever God has commanded or counseled, we do or avoid. That's it, pretty simple. <laughs> it seems simple, but let us put it into practice. Hence, under the word will are here comprised all things that have been proposed to us as a means of securing the happiness of heaven, whether they regard faith or whether they regard morals, all in a word that Christ the Lord has commanded or forbidden, either directly or through his church. And it is of this will that the apostle thus writes when he says, become not unwise, but understand what is the will of God. And that comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. Become not unwise, but understand what is the will of God. The will of sign. Whatever God has commanded, or whatever he's forbidden, that I do or that I avoid. Now when we say be done, that will finish up our class for today. Thy will be done. We first of all ask our Heavenly Father to give us the strength to obey his commandments. So that's a request for help. Yes, I want your will in heaven to be done on earth but I need your help. Thy will be done. So it's not only a statement, it's a request. A request that he help us. Because we need strength to fulfill the commandments. We know this. Give us the strength to obey his commandments and to serve him in holiness and justice all our days. To do all things according to his will and pleasure. To discharge all duties prescribed for us in sacred scripture. And under his guidance and assistance to perform all that becomes those who are born. Not of the will of the flesh, but of the will of God. Because thus, the following example of Christ the Lord was made obedient unto death. Even unto the death of the cross. Here we are coming up on Passion Week and we will hear that phrase very often. Christ the Lord who was made obedient unto death. Even unto the death of the cross. And finally... To be ready to bear all things rather than depart from his holy will in even the slightest degree. And that's where we avoid even our faults, if we can, and venial sin. It's not just a question of mortal sin. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It goes down to the littlest things. I wouldn't want to offend God even in the smallest degree. Let us stand and say our prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.